Before I start talking about the series, uh, I'd like to run a short video, um, which you give a little background on the Institute. And can that be? Uh, Twenty-five years ago, with no money and little more than a big idea, an entrepreneur's dream began in a basement in Northern California. But unlike some others in the area at that time, this entrepreneur's big idea didn't revolve around tiny microchips. It revolved around some of the oldest principles in history. Freedom, individual liberty, and the highest standards of independent academic inquiry. The Institute is an organization that was essentially bootstrapped based on a particular approach we wanted to take. The approach was to do serious work on serious issues, but to step back and get a better handle on what the effects of, of government policies might be and how best to solve these issues. Well, one of the things that uh, David set out to do with the Institute was to keep it outside of Washington, for starters. Uh, so and not to be affected by just ex what's going on every five minutes in Washington. To think about really serious issues, to think about them in a deep way, in a long run way, and to do academic quality work. We call it the first garage think tank because it was literally not in his garage but in his basement and just working 20 hours a day. From the outset, the fledgling Independent Institute faced an obstacle that in retrospect seems quaintly naive. The thought that with the Reagan revolution in full swing and the Soviet empire crumbling, the intellectual battle against socialism, oppression, and ever-expanding government had been won. In hindsight, we now know that that was, a, that was a fallacy. We know that the very cultural roots of the view that government is a solution to every problem were still there. David and the Institute forged ahead. Confident that despite the Reagan Revolution and crumbling of the Soviet Empire, the battle for liberty was nowhere close to being over. In 1987, the Institute's future research director, Robert Higgs, wrote what would become a landmark and prescient book, Crisis and Leviathan, which showed how governments use national emergencies, both real and imagined, to expand their own powers and limit individual freedom. Professor Higgs has shown that government grows not in terms of these usual views of social benevolence, but it grows in terms of crises that are announced and claimed. They create enormous fear, they create enormous anxiety, and they create the ability of political powers to assume new powers they didn't have before. By 1989, the Institute was growing, and it moved from San Francisco to a new and larger space in Oakland, with administrative, research, conference, and warehouse facilities. In a 1990 feature article, Success Magazine termed the Independent Institute the Empire of Ideas, acclaiming its uniquely entrepreneurial approach to policy research and education in producing an effective audience of over 70 million, as compared to the 5,000 to 10,000 audience of traditional Washington policy organizations with annual budgets averaging up to $30 million. Throughout the 1990s, the Institute remained at the vanguard of groundbreaking peer-reviewed research. In 1994, the Institute was critically influential in defeating the Clinton Health Plan as a result of its open letter to President Clinton, critiquing his proposed use of health price controls and signed by 565 economists and 76 other scholars. In 1996, the Institute began publishing the Independent Review a quarterly scholarly journal that has been edited since its inception by Robert Higgs. Even though I'm an economist by training and an economic historian in most of my writing, uh, I, I have uh, interests in, in law and philosophy and, and the other social sciences and, and in, uh, things that touch on these areas. So a lot of ground is covered in the Independent Review. A compelling difference in the Independent Institute's program is our awareness that crises are used to grow government. 
And this awareness led us in the aftermath of 9-11 to warn that the terrorist attacks may well be used to grow government in ways having little or nothing to do with security. In addition, and based on our studies, we advise the use of the constitutional provision of letters of mark and reprisal be used to target, apprehend, and bring to justice those individuals responsible for the attacks. Unfortunately, neither message was heeded as a new area of federal spending and power was launched, with spending increasing by 50% until 2008, trillions of dollars of new debt added since, and no end in sight. Our warnings have come true, and most Americans have today come to be receptive to the kind of analysis the Institute is known for in calling for a return to first principles in the ordering of society, just as the founders had intended. This is a theme that I think is particularly important today because uh, there's a, a, a debate uh, going on in many countries about what the best way to uh, encourage uh, entrepreneurship in developing countries is. Um, and there are uh, wide-ranging views about this. Uh, many of them, um, I suggest, uh, are uh, misguided and I think uh, it was a good time uh, to respond uh, to some of these uh, uh, wrong ideas. Welcome to MyGovCost.org. Every day we hear news about federal spending programs passed in Congress, annual budget deficits, and the ballooning national debt. But few of us can relate to the billion and trillion dollar figures thrown around in Washington. Have you ever wondered how much the war in Iraq, the recent bailouts, or Social Security are costing you personally? Here at MyGovCost.org, we'll show you the price tag of these programs. And more importantly, you can see what the value of those dollars would be worth if you could otherwise invest them in the stock market. Uh, that video, by the way, was done in 2011, at the time of our 25th anniversary, as you may have noticed. We're coming up to our 30th anniversary uh, next year.